This is State Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Well, Happy New Year. We begin the year with another Condo Insider show. It's hard to, be, to believe we've been doing this about two years now, trying to help nice. boards and owners understand association living and the opportunities, rights, and obligations. Some of you probably know we have seasons. We have the spring and the fall and the summer and the winter. But in the condo world, we have annual meeting season. It's a time when all the associations, all 1,750 of them, if they're on a calendar year basis, probably hold their annual meeting of all their owners in the first quarter of the year. So I'd be asking a good friend of mine, Steve Glanstein, professional registered parliamentarian, to come down and let's kind of review going into the annual meeting season, what it's all about. Welcome to the show again, Steve. Thank you very much and Happy New Year. It's Richard. always good to you. Yes. Just briefly again remind us what a professional registered parliamentarian is. Yeah, sure. I'm nationally certified as a professional registered parliamentarian. There's a national association of parliamentarians, about 4,000 members, and they credential parliamentarians. And we're experts on Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised, and then some other parliamentary authorities. So it goes beyond Robert's Rules, your, your training it, with regard to parliamentary it, authority. Yes, it does. Yet the credentialing is focused on Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised. And I know the answer. I know this is a dumb question, but are there a need for parliamentarians in annual meetings? How many annual meetings do you do a year? Well, I do about 32 of them in the month of March, so I'm a little busy. Uh, sometimes there are three in a day. Two in the morning on the neighbor island, and one in the evening on Kauai, or or even on Oahu at the other end of the island. So I, it's pretty busy. We're we're dealing with about 100 meetings a year, 110 per year. And why do boards hire parliamentarians to help with the annual meeting? What what, no. what what's the benefit? What what's the need, or what what causes it? Well, the practice is built over the last 30 years. And what has happened is they've recognized the value of having a parliamentarian to make sure the meeting stays on track, follows proper procedure. And, and maximizes the chance of, of, of surviving any sort of challenge after the meeting is adjourned. Yeah, from my personal experience, just as a side note, is you get board members or the president or the chair of the meeting who's an owner like everybody else, and then you have owners, and all of them become what they believe experts in Robert's rules, and they get into these arguments and fights over what they can make a motion on or do or not do under the governing documents and Robert's rules, where having an independent person there who really has no stake in this provides a degree of calming among the homeowners and the board or the chair of the meeting as rulings are made respective to the conduct of the meeting. Yeah, it makes a big difference. And having an expert is different than somebody who's just looked at the book to figure out what they want for one particular issue. Uh, we started out with one guy waving this red book around like, like it was the Bible. And then I, I asked him if it was the sayings of Chairman Mao because it was a little red book. Turned out it's this thing called Roberts. So I started reading and studying it, got into it, and then began correcting him and telling him what page number to look things up. So I got involved in it. The reading of it is very different than the practice. It can be very boring. It was the latest edition. It was written by lawyers. So it, it tends to drag on with long sentences. However, the practice of it is fascinating to be able to handle a group of people and help them make shared decision-making processes function well. Well, I know the answer to this question. How often do we hold an annual meeting? And the answer is probably <laughs> annually. Annually. That's good. <laughs> and, and so that's a good education point for everybody. But if, if, so kind of take us through the, the process. They're going to have an annual meeting. It's required by their bylaws or their governing documents. What are the steps they go through yeah. as far as notices and, and proxies? What steps do they go through to, in, in preparation for the annual sure. meeting? If, you, if you're talking about annual meetings of condominium associations, community associations, since this is condominium related, okay, they go through various steps. They do various notice posting to let everybody know that there's going to be a proxy solicitation. That way, if owners wish to have their name on the proxy as an option, they wish to have their statement uh, put out at association expense, they have that option. They go through that process, and then they send out the official notice at least 21 days later, and that notice will have the uh, sample proxy form as well as any other materials like me meeting rules or candidate statements for the annual meeting. And we know the answer, but share with everybody what a proxy is. Okay, a proxy is a power of attorney basically saying, you, Richard Emery, are going to be able to vote for me as if I was there. 
I'm the owner and I'm giving you a proxy to vote for, for me, just as if I was there. And I can put limitations on it. I can even let you transfer that proxy to somebody else if, if you wish. So that's what a proxy basically does. That's a power of attorney from yeah. an owner to someone. And under the state law, I believe there's four boxes. If the, if the association is issuing the proxy, there are four mandatory boxes that have to be on that proxy. Correct. And, and they are? Well, for condominium, community association, yeah, which is what we're talking. We'll focus on condos for today's yeah, show. We're, ta we're talking about four options on the association proxy. One of them is to give that proxy to the board to be decided by a majority of those directors who are present at the meeting. The second one is to give them to the board and have them the, uh, the, the uh, requirement to split it up. So it's almost like we're splitting the money up between board members. So if I give this proxy to what's called the board equal, and there's five board members there, they divide the voting power up by five and give one-fifth of that to each of the five directors there at the meeting. That's the second option. The third is the simpler one. I'm giving this proxy to Richard, and I put his name on a line and put his last name too, and, and that's the third option. The fourth one says, I want the meeting to go, but I don't want this proxy to be used in any voting capacity. That's called quorum only. And that's another one. That's the fourth checkbox. Now, some owners they they've made multiple checkboxes. They haven't checked them off. Last year, we got the statute changed. So if you do two, three, four checkboxes, it's kind of confusing or none. The proxy can only be used for quorum only. That was last year's clarification. But those are the four basic ones. We call them board majority, board equal, individual, quorum only. So assume I'm the president of the association and I'm on the board. Uh, it wouldn't preclude an owner from saying, I know Richard personally, I'm giving Richard Emery the proxy as a person or an owner or just as a person, even though I'm a board member. I could still designate any person as my proxy holder, even though they may be serving on the board. Right. That's the right of, that's the right of any owner. There's very limited restrictions that would stop you from being able to give a proxy to a board president or even someone who's not an owner. Maybe you wanted to give it to your attorney or, or a son-in-law or something like that. You can still do that here. What happens if that person doesn't show up? Well, depending on the language of the proxy, it may vary. Okay, if, the, if the proxy doesn't handle that, that eventuality, you don't show up, the proxy holder doesn't show up, it becomes basically a useless piece of paper. Now, some associations have put wording in there to say if nobody shows up, it's going to be used for quorum only, but it's got to be spelled out. So, in theory, it could be for quorum only if the proxy spells out that if neither one shows up, it's, uh, it's for that purpose. Yeah, in theory, it could be. What happened if the proxy was given to Richard Emery or Steve Glanstein? I mean, because now you're checking in, and there's two people who have the proxy. Uh, I'm going to guess more times than not they sort it out among themselves, but <coughs> how does that work? They, they sort it out. They usually sort it out among themselves. If you cannot determine who to give the proxy to, then it becomes invalid. So they usually figure it out among themselves to make it right. If they know about it in advance, the best thing for issues like that is to get legal help to make sure that you're on solid grounds as to what the interpretation is. Well, let's take another step further. Uh, I, you give me your proxy, and I all of a sudden find out I have to go on a business trip and I'm not going to be there. Can I take that proxy and write a letter and say I assign my, the proxy given to me to Fred? Or Yeah, that's called a power of substitution. And if your proxy provides for that, for example, I give Richard Emery a proxy with full power of substitution. What that's doing is that's allowing you, if you can't be there, or even if you are there, you want to substitute someone else's name, just write a letter and sign it and give it to them. Are there any time restrictions that could an owner or a person come to a meeting and say, here's my signed power of substitution, Richard can't be there. Are there any like mandatory times that that power of substitution has to be submitted before it's valid? The substitution itself doesn't have a mandatory requirement. It's, this, it's the proxy itself that does. The proxy has to be two days prior, two business days prior, 4.30 p.m. Is there any reason why a management company or a secretary of an association could make a waiver of the two-day requirement? Uh, <clears throat> I never saw one in the statute. It doesn't say if, if Steve wants to waive it at 4.31, it's okay. No, the statute is very clear that it's 4.30 p.m., second business day. And I, I don't see there, where there's any particular waiver of that. 
Yeah, it'd be interesting to see someday. I, I doubt a lawsuit would ever occur on that. If, if there was one that was really at 431 and, and it was turned down and, and they'd get in the argument of the accuracy of the clock. Yeah, you know? yeah. So. well, you know, that has a historical reason because somebody showed up with 250, 300 proxies at four o'clock in the afternoon. They couldn't count them on the same day. So there was, there was some real reasons. Today with computers, it could be that that reason doesn't exist the way it used to. So, but right now it's a pretty hard limit. So let's just assume we've gone through the proper notice. You know, we've we've said we're going to hold a meeting. If you want to uh, give us information, to be go. It's a, it's a single eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper as an owner soliciting right. proxies. You can include it. Subsequent to that, you get an official notice with the proxy attached, right. and you've got to submit it with certain required information: name, date, <coughs> unit number, the basic stuff mm -hmm. with respect to the proxy. And so now we get to the annual meeting, and there's what we call an agenda or order of business. Where does the order of business come from? Okay, that usually comes from the bylaws. If it's not in the bylaws, we go to Robert's rules. But you usually find it under annual meetings, under meetings in the bylaws of most associations. And that order of business starts out basically after you call the meeting to order. You basically provide a proof of notice. You let people know there's a quorum. Then you've got reports that are done. You've got election inspectors followed by an election. Then there's unfinished business if they have any, very rare that they do. And then new business, and then they adjourn the meeting. That's the order of business. So where does the owner's forum fit into that? Uh, I developed the owner's forum about 30 years ago, 31 years ago, because uh, the annual meeting is a business meeting. And since it's a business meeting, there's no debate without a motion. It's very structured. This is what we do. We do tax resolution, we do election, we get the minutes done, we adjourn. And what happened was the experience that I had with people wanted to express various positions, tell the board what they wanted to do for the upcoming year. So it was like a pot that's being boiled and you're not letting the top off. And then it ultimately explodes. So what we did is we created an owner's forum after the adjournment of the annual meeting, respecting that those owners who've come may want to bring issues up for the new board. And we usually have about 10 or 15 minutes there and, and focus them on what do you want the new board to do? We can't fix the past, but we sure can get a list for the new board. That's done before or after the annual meeting, so it's not a part of the official business? It's usually done after the annual meeting. <coughs> Excuse me, but it's, uh, sometimes, they do it, sometimes they do it over drinks the night before the annual meeting. It really does depend upon the culture of the group. Yeah, well, I've seen it certain occasions where... Uh, uh, boards have decided to hold an owner's forum before they call the meeting to order. Well, they'll call it to order and they'll say something to the effect, there's no objection, we're going to take a 15-minute recess mm -hmm. to have a short owner's forum. Mm -hmm. When they have some major legal issue or some major issue before the owners vote, they want to get information out into their hand. And they may come back after the meeting with a bigger annual mm -hmm. forum, but I've seen an occasion that mm -hmm. uh, uh, a uh, form is done before, but more times it's done after. Yeah. But we can say that's normally done outside the meeting, so normally it's not part of the minutes. Yeah, that's 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 very true. And when when there are big legal issues where we need to have the attorney address the group under reports of officers, what we'll do is we'll see if there's any objection to having the attorney uh, address the group regarding this particular legal issue. If no one objects, then the attorney can actually make a report. Okay, well, we're right in the middle of the annual meeting. Uh, none of the owners have gotten angry yet. So we're going to take a short break, and we'll be back in one minute. We have this crazy thing going on today. I was just walking by, and all these DJs and producers are set up all around the city. I just walked by, and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music.
Hello, and welcome back to Condo Insider. We're with Steve Glanstein talking about the normal procedures for annual meetings in condominium associations. I remind everybody we're talking this in a broad brush general way. You need to always look at your governing documents to see what they actually say, because more times than not, we're right on point for probably 90% of the condos, but in this world, there's always exceptions to everything we've ever seen. But we've already talked about, we called the meeting to order, we've got a quorum, more than 50.01% of the entire membership, and we're gonna conduct the meeting, we have proxies, and we're now gonna talk about what we can do in an annual meeting. So I'm an owner, and I'm there, and I'm ready to say, I make a motion that the board of directors reduce the maintenance fees by 50%. <laughs> what do you tell the chair to do? Okay, my advice to the chair, after looking at the documents, is to rule the motion out of order generally because it violates the bylaws, which specifically provide that the board of directors is responsible for determining the budget, the maintenance fees of the organization. When you have a bylaw that says, hey, board, this is your job to do, any motion that interferes with that bylaw is, is ruled out of order. Yeah, because it's, the bylaw specifies, like an amendment right. to the bylaws. Don't right, like, you could... exactly. I mean, they could propose an amendment to the bylaws to say that the owners can decide what the maintenance fees are, but, you know, that would have to be an amendment to the bylaws, and they'd have to check for compliance with state law, things like that. How about, an, oh, I'm going to call it an advisory motion. <coughs> uh, if we're in new business, let's say. I make a motion that the board consider establishing a committee to review our budget maintenance fees and look at reducing them if possible. Okay, well, I would advise you, if you wanted the motion to be a proper one, it's a requesting that the board consider the following. Because when you make that motion, you, if you do it in the form of a request, it's very clear that it's not violating the, the bylaws when it comes to the, to the strict analysis that this is the board's job. If, so the motion requesting that the board consider reducing the maintenance fees due to the recent court settlement, you, you know, would, would, in my opinion, be in order with many associations. And that, that can happen. Sometimes it goes in unanimously. So it's important, to, as we do the framework of an annual meeting, to understand mm -hmm. This is a meeting that's being conducted pursuant to the government documents, and it's not the wild, wild west. Owners have limited authority what they can do and not do at an annual meeting. They just can't come in and say, cut the maintenance fees in half. Or fire the resident manager, you know. Right, so there's a lot of restriction. Yeah. So what is the normal business legally conducted at an annual meeting? The normal business for most annual meetings is basically the reports come out by the president. They may or may not have an auditor's report. They appoint tellers. They do an election. They do the tax resolution. They adjourn. And then they go home. And in some cases, some governing documents, just to be accurate, provide that the members or the owners also either approve the auditor or approve the management company uh, is a part of the normal script as well. Yeah, we've, we've tried to get some of that changed, but when it comes to the auditor, depending upon the wording of the documents, the owners might actually approve the auditor, which is, is, is kind of humorous because the owners are not going to interview four, three or four different auditors. They usually end up approving whatever the board has selected. So it becomes an, one of those after the facts. If there's no objection, the board selection of the auditor will be pr approved. Since there's no objection, it is approved. And there's some other risks. I've seen situations where uh, the, bio, the governing documents, the bylaws require that the management company's contract be approved at every meeting by a majority of the owners, which is 50.01% of all the owners. So you could have a meeting where 51% were in attendance, and the one guy who got the dog mm -hmm. lease violation, mm -hmm. who doesn't like the management company, votes no, and so you only have 49% voting power there, and where in right. theory the bylaws say you have to have a majority of all the owners approve the management contract. Yeah, this clause has really done nothing to help associations. In, at least in my opinion. It basically puts it in there, and they still have to have a management company, so even though they might have voted down the management contract, I've seen it where every five years they vote it down just because somebody's angry because of, as you said, a dog leash violation. The board goes and does a study. They come back as a result of the study, determine that they're very happy where they are, and they go to the next year's meeting, and they approve the contract. And then three years later, they end up voting it down. And for 17 years, they've had the same management company, but they're on a five-year program where it gets voted down every five years. 
Yeah, I think, I think kind of it's saying the unintended consequences yeah. that exist by, by some of these things. So let's go to the election. So most boards have what I call staggered elections. So if you have a five-member board, for example, three are voted one year, two are voted the following year. But people always wonder about straight voting or regular voting versus cumulative voting. What is the difference and where did that come from? Well, you got to kind of back up a little bit. Because the voting is cast based upon what power, what voting strength you've got in the bylaws, or declaration rather. So it could be a percentage common interest, or it could be by lot, depending upon what type of organization it is. With cumulative voting versus regular voting, if I've got four, or say three slots open for election, cumulative voting would allow me to vote three times times my voting powers for that one for one person, or two for one person, one for another. It allows me to distribute my votes such that I can, I can um, get a minority representative on the board. Now, cumulative voting goes back to the 1800s in Chicago for the election of aldermen. They, they got rid of it a few years back, but, but it has been used in, in United States history before. Again, as many positions as are open, that's how many times you can vote. Now, with what's called straight voting, if I've got three positions open, I can't vote twice for one person. I can only vote up to once for each person. So the straight voting, it's a little bit easier to calculate. The cumulative voting, it's a little bit more difficult because the numbers get harder. And, but it does allow for some minority representation. Well, from your experience, what's your view of cumulative voting? I think it creates a, a, an issue generally because then the person elected has allegiance to the minority that elected them and I think they've got to recognize your allegiance once you get on that board is to the entire association not to the vocal minority that elected you but it is one on the other hand it's one opportunity for a small group to get one person on the board well some of the things I've seen over my years in the industry is that after the meeting and the gavel's falling someone has says maybe right that we didn't add up correctly who won. Mm -hmm. And so there's this discrepancy that once the meeting is adjourned, you announce the results of Fred won, that afterwards when they have a chance to take a second look at it, they found out Bob won. Mm -hmm. What happens? Well, they're taking a look at it in an unofficial context. Once the hammer has fallen, the meeting is over, generally those results are final. However, if they discover something, they can actually order a recount within, th within, 90, within three months, or quarterly time interval. And that's happened at least twice. So how do they do that? Do they have to have another meeting? They call another meeting and organize it, and, and uh, they vote with the owners to do a recount? How, what is kind of the process? It's a two-step process. First of all, you have to call the meeting. You go through the whole process of calling the meeting, doing, doing posting if you're going to solicit proxies, et cetera. And then a motion has to come up at that special meeting to authorize the recount. So the association is physically authorizing the recount by, through the adoption of this motion. Once they do that, if they approve it, then they recount. If they disapprove it, then they don't recount, and the meeting basically is over. And the original count stands? Yes. Now, I know, this, I know the answer, but I want to just make sure everybody understands it. So at the recount, you're not having new voting, and you're just recounting the original ballots. You're not allowing for additional people to show up and, and vote, correct? That's correct. It's, you're just recounting what has been turned in at that annual meeting. See, one of the things I've, I see happen, sadly, <laughs> is you'll have owners and they'll have a debate on who they want and the politics that go along with it. And you'll have a person or a board member that has a whole bunch of proxies. And then they take the opportunity to adjourn the vote. Yeah. And that person forgets to vote. Yeah. And all of a sudden they expected they were going to win the election. But they found out afterwards they didn't win the election because this person forgot to vote his 20 proxies. Mm -hmm. What can you do about that, if anything? Well, if the meeting's adjourned, it's too late. If the, there's three times when that happens. For example, let's say we've closed the voting, people are counting. That's the first time. And someone says, oh, the board. One case, the board, actually, they forgot to vote. And nobody would have gotten elected in, in this case. So what we did is we acknowledged it to the owners and asked if there's any objection to opening the polls. And they laughed a lot about it, open the polls, the board's votes went in. Crisis averted. That's the first time. The second time is after you've announced the results. 
At that point, in order for them to reopen, that, that at the meeting now, it takes unanimous vote. And if you don't get unanimous, it doesn't reopen. The third time is if after the meeting's adjourned. That's too late. You can't fix that. Well, it's over. So it's important to vote. Yes, that's, that's as simple as it gets. It's important to vote. Yeah, very yeah. good. But I hate to say that. I've seen that it's more happened. than once. People get excited and all of the frills. You take the adjournment, they start talking to their neighbor and their friend, and, mm -hmm. and they forget they had these personally issued proxies, and they forget to vote them, and, uh, and all of a sudden they're unhappy with the results. Because I know in one particular case, they wanted to reopen the voting during the meeting, but obviously the other side didn't, didn't vote for it. So yeah. They didn't have unanimous, so... Uh, that was it, it was done. It, it was a done deal. <coughs> and there, was, there was nothing you could do about it and other than someone made a mistake. Right, and, and uh, I've had him violate the rules where the morning after, the guy said it should have been there, and then the board decided to just put him on. That notwithstanding the legal advice to the contrary, they're just lucky they weren't sued. So I've, I've, had, I've had them actually violate the procedural rules. Fortunately, they are not my clients. Okay, we're down to the end of the show. I have two quick questions, so I have to be quick answers. Number one, my question is, owners always want to see the proxies of, of the people who are at the meeting, and when, when do owners have the right to see the election tally in the proxies? Well, after the meeting, up to 30 days, after the meeting, they can see it. So they can't see it before the meeting. So no, they can't no. go in and demand to see other owners' proxies until after the meeting. Correct. And my second and last comment before we, we end the show for this week is to say what recommendations do you have to owners and boards about annual meetings? That's a, that's a good one. Remember that the annual meeting is to get business done. And if you have issues that are important and critical for an association governance, Get them to the board early. Don't wait until the annual meeting. Well, I want to thank you for being on our show today. It's always, I learn something every time yeah. I've been doing this uh, industry practice for 25 plus years. And uh, I always learn something new about parliamentary yeah. procedure and would recommend to our owners that have big associations or a lot of business at the annual meeting, considering hiring a professional registered parliamentarian. Besides Steve, there's others in town that make it much better to protect your association, that the results of the meeting are defendable and protected. And so, at the end of the show, again, Happy New Year, and thank you for watching Condo Insider, and tune in next Thursday at 3 o'clock for another exciting show. <coughs> <Aloha>. <coughs>